ladies and gentlemen, to give her her full title, Professor Sophie Scott! <laughs> Cognitive neuroscience, and today I'm going to be talking about something that makes me and you very, very powerful. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'm sorry, all I can say is that doesn't normally happen. <laughs> I'm very interested in human brains and how they deal with human communication, so how my brain's controlling the sounds of the speech that I'm making now, and how your brain's able to decode that information and also tell all sorts of other stuff from me about my voice you couldn't see me you could tell I was a woman you could tell if I was angry that's all there that's part of what's going on this is the room that we use a lot for recording stimuli for our studies of this land of nature this is called an anechoic chamber and it's so called because there are no echoes in here so you get this very clean sound which is very good for um, making good recordings that we can then analyze ac acoustically and using our brain imaging studies but it also means that um it's a slightly unpleasant environment to be in because you don't get any of the normal room sound that you get when you're moving around buildings. There's, there are no echoes and it always feels to me like I've got something wrapped around my head. One of the things that we've been doing is looking at, for example, what happens in your brain when you hear the sound of somebody laughing because they're helpless with laughter or because they're sort of laughing in a more social way. And that required us to get people into the anechoic chamber and then do whatever it took to make them laugh. How's that? A few more. <laughs> Sometimes that was harder than at other times, but we found actually it worked best if we got groups of people who were friends and then they found it a lot easier to make each other laugh. <laughs> I'm losing. <laughs> I'm very interested in human laughter. It seems to be uh, very unlike certain other emotions that we express so unlike things like fear or anger we use laughter in a very social way so laughter is used very widely in conversation and in play and we will pay good money to go and see people make us laugh it's one of the first emotions to be expressed in infancy. So babies are born and very early on they can signal displeasure by crying. The first positive emotion to be expressed, the first specific one, is laughter. So babies smile at about six weeks old and that really makes their parents very happy because there's been quite a lot of not smiling before then. And then at around two months they start to laugh. And laughter always has this very familiar trajectory, so it always first emerges during some sort of tickling behaviour, some kind of interaction between the adult and the baby. And the baby laughs it makes the adult laugh and you sort of set up this cycle of laughter. It seems to be one of the reasons why in adulthood laughter is very, very contagious because we spend quite a lot of time teaching this to babies, encouraging this in babies. You can see it having a really important role in play in children. Can you, can you... Oh, then I'm dead. Okay. We'll laugh at something we find funny when we're on our own. If we're with our friends, we will laugh much, much more, and we seem to be seeing that really happening in the brain. Now, I, I know what you're thinking. <laughs> <laughs> this so-called mirror system, this brain areas which are to do with the control of output, but which are sensitive to the input of the emotions, are more strongly engaged by positive emotions like laughter and triumph, and that does seem to reflect the way that they get used socially, and that you have this contagiousness of something like laughter, whereas you don't necessarily have contagiousness of fear. If you started screaming, I might well be frightened and I'll probably run away, but I won't necessarily just start screaming because you are. Yeah.